All right, guys, we talked about it for many, many months. We made jokes about it. We didn't think it was possible when Dana White said that he has purchased or he acquired a island, but he actually did. It. That island was Jazz Island in Abu Dhabi, and we had Fight Island. UFC 251 went down this past Saturday in Abu Dhabi at Fight Island. We had three title fights, and we're here to recap it. This is the Shillin' and Duffy Show. My name is Keith Shillin'. I'm a writer for Sure Dog and Cage Side Press, also the executive producer of the Loudmouth MA Podcast Network. Here to join me to talk about all these fights and all the action that went down this past Saturday is the Duffy to the Shillin' and Duffy Show, Mr. Ben Duffy, the senior editor of Sure Dog. Ben, how you doing, man? I'm doing really well. I'm just finally recovering from a long night of fights, but long but but worth it. You know, it, it was it was a hell of a card. I'm I'm looking forward to breaking it down with you. Yeah, I heard it was said that it was the longest uh, main card in UFC history, uh, total fight time wise. Uh, I heard oh. they they said that on the uh, broadcast. I don't know if that's true, but I'm sure. I mean, it ended with three title fights and. Two of them went the distance, and one ended late in the third round or in the fifth round. Yeah, yeah, that's bananas. It was so long. <laughs> yeah, before we get to the action, guys, if, if I sound a little stuffy or anything, I'm I am a little under the weather. I have a cold. Um, hopefully, it's nothing serious. Um, but if I sound a little different than usual, I had you fight on. If if Rose Nine Unis can win with a huge uh, covering of her eye, swollen eye, I can fight through this podcast. Um, let's start in the main event. Kamara Usman has defended his welterweight title successfully for the second time. This time he did it over Jorge Gamebred Masvidal. Masvidal took the fight on just six days notice. He had to cut, according to his management and his team, he had to cut 22 pounds. He did that successfully um, as he replaced Gilbert Burns, who was forced off the card from uh, due to the coronavirus, tested positive for the coronavirus. Uh, Masvidal had, we talked about it on the roundtable, that he had the most unbelievable 15 months where everything went his way, even to on the broadcast and revealing the cover of the new UFC video game where he was one of two fighters on the cover. But finally he hit a hiccup as he lost. He was utterly dominated in a unanimous decision. I'm going to say something bold and tell me if you disagree. So obviously a lot of people are saying, well, he only took this fight on six days. notice. what would you expect? I don't think the six days matter at all. I think if you had a full six week camp, eight week camp, I expected the fight would be very similar to what we saw. Do you agree or disagree? I still don't think he would have won, but I'm I would be interested. Let me just say that. I don't want an immediate rematch, God no. But you know, if Masvidal goes out, beats a couple more legitimate contenders, Usman defends against the dudes in line, like Gilbert Burns, Leon Edwards. I would be happy to see this again after both guys have had full camps. But no, I, I don't think it would have made like a telling difference it, to the outcome of the fight. Yeah, I, I think it, I don't think it would have made any difference at all. Now, now Masvidal, he started off well. He was um, moving and landed some shots. But the thing about Usman is he's not fighting to win. Like his his game is not to like right from the start to win and win the whole game. His game is to make you work. And as it goes on, that's when he starts like pulling away from the pack. Uh, one thing they kept saying on the broadcast was like how many takedown attempts Masvidal was stuffing. And I kept, I had two friends over who were watching it, two very casual fans. They just, oh, was, oh hey, Masvidal, let's go over Keith's house and watch it. And I was explaining to them like those takedowns, and this is just my opinion, is those takedown attempts are not even to get him down. It's to close the distance and just make him work. Like get in the clinch, build up lactic acid in his arms and his legs, stomp in his foot, knee in his his leg, give him some shoulder strikes. What I said on the on the round table is the best part of Usman's game, I don't know if you remember me saying this, was not his wrestling, not his striking, not his top control, but just his ability to keep going and hit you every moment of the fight. He is hitting you, he's making you work. You know, he'll punch you in the thigh. He'll like we saw this fight a lot of foot stomps. Um, so when they, when the analysts were talking about how well Masvidal was doing, I was like, I don't think he's doing, if anything, I thought Masvidal's game plan was terrible. Um, the fact that he was circling himself right to the cage, he would made it easy on Usman. He was fighting on that, you know, you have your, you have your black outline in the middle of the, of the cage or those double yellow lines. He was fighting on the outside. That's exactly where 
um, Usman wants it. So, I mean, how, how did you see this fight? Uh, I agree with you. I was pretty impressed by Masvidal's ability to stop the takedown attempts. I figured Usman would be able to get him down early and often. So it was pretty impressive. Some of the individual uh, takedowns he denied, he was really good at just denying Masvidal the level change just with an underhook or two underhooks and just basically shucking him off like Krokop used to do. Uh, and he did a few of like the little BJ Penn things where – Usman would get a leg, and Masvidal's like, oh, lift my leg as high as you want. I'm just going to hop on the other leg until you give up. That that was pretty impressive as well, but ultimately, you're right. He spent too much time circling to where you could see the warning track. I mean, I know it's not called the warning track in MMA, but I, I think of that every time I see that you know stripe uh, around the, the outside of the octagon. And yeah, that's where Usman wanted him, and he mashed him into the fence. I saw a lot of people on Twitter uh, just really, really upset about the foot stomps, like... They're not doing anything. Well, people either complaining that they were like, you know, a, a shitty cheap move or that they don't do anything, which I mean, it's got to be one or the other guys. Uh, but one, they were making Masvidal miserable, you know, like as annoying as they were for you to watch. I assure you they were more miserable for him to, to <laughs> take. Right. But That's the thing right. is, they were almost distracting from the real work he was doing, because in each of those long clinch exchanges, he might land five or six foot stomps which was almost hiding the fact that he was also digging two or three really hard, short rights to the ribs, which, I, I mean, every time he did that in the clinch, I was like, okay, that's another minute of this fight that, that Usman has won in my book. Yeah, no, I I love that, the breaking down of that, because everything you said is things that I noticed. Uh, you said that people say foot stomps are effective. Well, ask Makahuas if it's not effective, or ask Paul Varlins if, if it's not effective. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know, as I say this, Probably about three people got that reference. Uh, I'm one of them. That so was a I'm... UFC 7 <laughs> reference. Uh, and, and that was, yes, that was 7. That was not 70. or That was nope. 7, the number 7. Um, uh, yeah, I, one of the things I talked about on on the roundtable was that it really impressed me about Usman is is those rib shots that he presses you against. He gets that chest to chest thing and he pins you against it. And nobody has been able to get off of it. Uh, nope. Tyron Woodley was getting – I mean this guy was a – High level NCAA Division One wrestler. He pressed Woodley against the cage, beat him up. RDA beat him up. Um, obviously, we saw it with Masvidal. I said in the broadcast, I mean on the um, roundtable that like that's how I picture hell. Like hell, me me press against the cage. Usman, you know, press me up with his chest and just hitting you in the ribs over and over again. And there's nothing you can do. And and the only difference is it doesn't stop after 25 minutes. It just keeps going for all of eternity. Uh, <laughs> Usman, let me ask you this question. Is there a better clinch fighter right now than, than Kamar Usman? For what he wants to do in the clinch, he's the most effective guy. I mean, he, he's the most effective person in the clinch at getting you on the cage, keeping you on the cage for basically as long as he wants to keep you there. I, I mean, he's not a clinch fighter like you know, like a classic Vanderlei Silva or Anderson Silva where they're going to sure. get both hands behind your neck and like just knee you in the ribs until your guts all come out your butthole. But uh, for what he wants to do, which is land his offense and basically smother yours, he's he's absolutely it. He is suffocating in, in the clinch. Because, yeah, I mean, Masvidal had only a few avenues to victory here and he couldn't get any of them off if he's being smashed into the cage by Usman. Yeah, and so talking about like really think about Anderson Silva, what Anderson Silva did to Rich Franklin in the clinch, and and what Vandalay Silva did to Quentin Jackson and stuff. But they they had a Muay Thai clinch. They were from that right. plum where they grab around the neck, get tuck the mm -hmm. elbows in, and then destroy you with the knees. He's doing more of a Greco Roman pummeling over under clinch, and yep. he's all about like position. John Jones tweeted out during the fight that he looked like him in the clinch, and I disagreed. Now John Jones meant it as a compliment, and and. So I, I agree with that, like how amazing I am. But John Jones is more – he'll get inside, slicing up the elbows. Like he's a – no. Like Usman is more like press you against the cage and just big brother you. Like you're just – you're, yeah. you're too – like it actually looked a lot like the Marcin Tybura, Maxim Grisham fight where Tybura won that because he was just so much bigger than Grisham. This is like the same thing. Like, like even though they're the same way, Usman is just so much stronger and it, the second you give him an inch, he'll take you down or he'll he'll, he'll disengage. And, and what I love about when he, dis he disengaged, he'd hit one strike and then 
get right back in the position. So he'd be there before you even got a chance. That's why right now, I mean, Usman's clinch, and I'm I'm going through the top contenders like Leon Edwards, Gilbert Burns. Like who can stop? Like I saw the Gilbert Burns. I was going to take. So when we did the roundtable, I did the tape study for the Gilbert Burns first, and I was about at sixty forty picking Usman before a tape study. After tape study, I was like ninety ten Usman because I saw Gilbert Burns actually get beat up by. Like he struggled against Gunnar Nelson in the clinch. Tyron Woodley, when he had moments, not many moments in the fight, he, what he did was he was able to press Gilbert Burns against clinch. If Kamaru Usman, who's better than both those guys in the clinch, gets you in there, that's a really bad situation. So, yeah, Kamaru Usman, I would say get used to this. Get used to him grinding out rounds, grinding out victories. And honestly, if you don't like, you don't like seeing Kamaru Usman as your champion, the only other solution, right, in my opinion right now, it's Kobe Covington. Like Kobe Covington is the only guy that could possibly beat him. He's the only guy that could maybe win those clinch situations and or at least neutralize them. I don't see Gilbert Burns doing it. I don't see Leon Edwards doing it. I don't see Conor McGregor, whoever you want to be. Um, is there somebody else that you see that could neutralize uh, these positions or at least win those positions? There are guys in the division with a really good – who can land really good offense out of the clinch. But they don't have just the diesel to to do it because you, you're right in that Jones's clinch is different uh, than the Newsman's. Jones wants a little room in the clinch, like he's gonna want like you know an overhook, underhook, even like a single collar tie. But he wants enough space that he can like start throwing, uh, you know, level elbows, uppercuts, knees to your leg. Whereas as you said, Usman just wants chest on chest because that lets him land. He lands less offense, but you land none. He's just stifling what you want to do. So even like picturing, you know, a, a guy with a good offensive clinch, like a Vicente Luque type, he's not going to be able to do it to Usman. Usman's just going to smash him. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, let's let's talk about Masvidal real quick. Uh, not the best performance. Um, I I I agree. Like you do have to give him some of a pass, being that he did take it on six dinners. While I've already said that, I don't think. It would have changed. You think he would have had a little better performance, but it seemed sound like you were still thinking he would have, he would have lost with a full camp. Uh, let me ask this from a popularity sense. Being, I think this is going to do very good pay per view numbers. I don't know how many of your friends reached out to you, but I had a lot of casual friends uh, friends reach out to me. Do you think Jorge Masvidal's stock dropped in just from his popularity sense? Being that you know people paid sixty five bucks to watch this, and he didn't have much offense. I actually don't think so. I, To me, it seemed like, and this is just me kind of watching the the voice of the Twitter, the, all the animosity seemed to be headed uh, towards Usman. Like, this would be a great fight if only Usman would let Masvidal do cool stuff. It is basically, <laughs> I mean, in not, in not so many words, but that that's what it seemed you know, to be like. I, like, I'm sure if there had been a full house and a normal crowd there, they would have just been cheering every little thing Masvidal did and just booing every time Usman got uh, Masvidal to the fence. Because even I felt that a little bit, and I had no rooting interest in the sure, fight, sure. but just as someone who wants to see cool shit happen, I was like, oh, man, all right, here we go. <laughs> you know. Uh, so I, I don't think it really hurt his stock that much. You yeah. know, like... He, yeah, I agree. I mean, when you, you see other guys who became popular whose stack just never goes away. I mean, you think about like when Kimbo Slice was losing matches and people, he was still popular. Uh, you think about Connor when he lost match and Nate, Nate Diaz is still one of the most popular guys, almost a 500 fighter in the UFC. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, one thing I was saying, like, like I said, I had two friends. They were, they seemed getting a little bored. And I was saying, like, I'm probably the only person in America that's actually enjoying watching Usman do because to see a game plan work so well that there was it to me Usman was all about taking real estate and what i mean by that is every single time Jorge Masvidal reset and took a like if he took one step back Usman took two steps forward mm-hmm. and closed that to a little this there was one part i believe um i think it was a groin strike or an eye poke i don't remember it was there, there was a break in action but at this point Usman was already way ahead um, I don't remember who the referee was. I think it was Mark Gard. I don't remember who the referee was, but the referee broke the two it of was, them. Yeah, uh, Goddard. Yeah, okay. So Gard broke both of them. He was checking on, on Usman. I don't know if you saw this. I'm sorry, checking on Masvidal. While Masvidal and- was taking seconds, Usman, 
Usman was standing like like you know bouncing around, but every single time he bounced around, he took like a little like, like a little like no, two, four, two or three inches closer, two or three inches, and closer. got it to the point where Goddard had to like make him just get back. Yeah, yeah, he, it was it was he pretty was, funny. He was ready to let him set. Like he was like, and then every single time Goddard turned his back from him, it was like it was like wrestling, like a uh, professional wrestling. Every time the the referee turns away, the guy cheats, and Usman would take a couple <laughs> steps closer. Like he knew, like as soon as we break, I want to be right back on him. Um, and just to me that see that. And I, I thought it was a masterpiece by uh, Kamara Usman. Now, obviously, he's not going to win him over France. This might be a good thing, though, if they could turn him into a villain. They could turn him into the, you know, like the UFC can use that as, you know, the guy that, hey, you paid all this money and Usman uh, didn't give you what you want. Like, turn the fans against it, have people root, want to see him get knocked out. Like, that could be, that could definitely be a good thing. So let's talk about what's next. Uh, Dana White said after the fight that they're going to do the Gilbert Burns fight. Um, I think most people, it's down to Duke Gilbert Burns and Leon Edwards. Uh, I'm okay with Gilbert Burns. I mean, that's the guy that was supposed to be booked. Um, the fact that I think Usman leaving the team, I think that actually sells a little bit more to this. Um, mm-hmm. I know he didn't leave on an animosity, and I think he actually might continue to train back there if he's not fighting Gilbert Burns. But I just feel like it gives you a little bit of storyline. Uh, do you disagree that Gilbert Burns should be the next guy? I didn't love them slotting Burns into it when they made the fight, but now that they've done it, I think it's even worse to just, you know, blow him off because he got the uh, positive COVID test. Like, let him have a shot. It's not like he's undeserving. He's on a hell of a streak, and the Edwards fight is going to be there. Obviously, Edwards has been waiting and waiting and waiting. The fight, I mean, it'll promote itself pretty well. Like, Leon can be a pretty salty guy on, on the mic. I think he and Usman are going to have plenty to say to each other. Their last fight was, I mean, hell, it's the it's Edwards' only loss in the UFC, and it's also probably the hardest time anyone has given uh, Usman other than maybe Covington. Yeah, I was going to say other than so, Covington, yeah. So, so really, you can argue that there are two guys who have given each other the other guys, you know, toughest or, or close to toughest fight in the UFC. It should be a great fight. Yeah. And he, he might be the only one who, I don't know if he's as physical as Usman, but he's a pretty strong physical. He's a big guy. Like he might be able to match Usman's physicality, strength, power. Um, I don't even Covington is Covington is more of a technique wrestler. Like he's more of a, uh, output wrestler. Like he's, he's going to, he can match him there, but there's pure strength and power. Uh, I don't think he can match him there. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said about the fact that they already made the Burns one. Uh, Burns was kind of right place, right time when he got booked. Masvidal was in a negotiation, um, what was, what was it? having, you know, negotiation conflict with the UFC, uh, Edwards with the travel ban and all this coming to the RDB. Um, Connor, same thing, all these guys. So, you know, Connor, you're, you're not putting Connor in an empty stadium. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree that the like, Gilbert Burns, what he has done probably hasn't, you know, his streak in the UFC is not as long as Edwards, but the one up he has is the fact that they already, that he already, they already booked it too. As you mentioned, Usman has already beaten Edwards, but also the fact that Edwards was, was going to get him the title shot was to beat Tyron Woodley. Well, he didn't get the chance, and then Burns filled in and did it. So that's yep. why I, I agree. Burns is probably one. If 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 Masvidal beat Usman, that would have opened up a lot more possibilities because I don't think they do. I don't think they do Burns. I think they might do do Leon Edwards because of the little the little uh, backstage fight. But even more, you got the Colby Covington to be former teammates, this and that. Like if Masvidal won, the the, the possibilities were kind of endless. But with yep. Usman winning, I disagree. So let's go to Masvidal. Um, I just mentioned, I think Kobe Covington, I think if, I think they've, the UFC's had these natural, these great beefs. They've, they lost out on Covington with Tyron Woodley. I think they should not miss out on this. They need to make Masvidal and Covington. Am, am I wrong? I, I don't think you're wrong. I think that makes a lot of sense competitively. It also makes a lot of sense, obviously, from a promotional perspective. And watching Usman versus Masvidal, makes me like the idea of the Masvidal Covington fight better. Just, Why you know, the 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 level of takedown defense that Masvidal showed uh like is encouraging. I think Covington is actually probably a 
better striker than Usman is, just in terms of, of strict technique. So I'd like to see that match up. And Covington probably won't employ the the set of tactics that Usman used to neutralize Masvidal's offense so effectively. You know, I I, I think we'll see coming like a couple battles there. Covington, whether he can get the takedown or not, and how well Covington is able to do on the feet against uh, Masvidal. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think it'd be really fun. Just to just to pre-talk all that up, that that'd be fun. It'd get really cool. personal and and we've talked about this. I love I love the drama. Like I love the drama. I want the drama. Uh I hate when guys are you know, like I, I didn't like that Holloway and Volkanovski started having a little bit of drama and then as soon as they started fighting they're hitting hitting hands and everything. Like I like the drama. Like hit hands afterwards, like be friends afterwards. <laughs> um so so we're both in agreement. Gilbert Burns next for Kamar Usman and we would book uh, Kobe Covington. So let me, that that leaves Leon Edwards out. Uh, what would we do with Leon Edwards? Man, <laughs> I think Leon Edwards could sit. I I don't even know if Leon Edwards should take a fight with Tyron Woodley at this point. I don't. I I think yeah. that one is passed. I to, I totally agree. You got nothing. You got nothing to gain now. You got everything to lose. Yeah. I mean, if if he wants a, a fight, to um, well, it's it wouldn't exactly be a stay busy fight. If uh, they had him fight another top 10 guy, but there are guys uh, floating around there. He's already beaten Dos Anjos very convincingly. Uh, you know, yeah. Kiesa's out there off of that three impressive wins at, at welterweight. And that's a fight that I didn't even really think about until just now. But what a, I mean, what a style matchup. Yeah, that might that might be the matchup right there, and I think I think that's a good stylistic matchup for Leon Edwards. I, I feel like Leon Edwards would win that one, keep him busy. But you're right; it might be best to sit out. But who knows how quick Usman gets back in there? How long is that going to put him out? He's already been sitting out for a long time. Um, he might not want to, you know, but he might not have a choice. With everything that's going on in the world, he might not have a choice. Uh, uh, speaking of, we got to move on. We got to move on to the Coleman event. This is the fight that is getting the most uh, narrative, the most talk on. Twitter. It is the rematch of the featherweight title match between Alex Volkanovski and Max Holloway. This time, Alex Volkanovski entered the cage as the champion, and he also left the cage as the champion as he won a very close, razor close, I'd say controversial, because MMA seems to be split. Uh, I watched the fight live Mind you, I have friends there. We're talking, this and that. I scored it live, 48-47 for Holloway. I rewatched okay. it today, and I actually switched. I gave Volkanovski 48-47. Uh, all that said, it is extremely co- close. Like, anybody who calls it a robbery should just never watch MMA. Like, you don't know what a robbery is. Um, how did you score this fight? I scored it 48-47 for Volkanovski, but... I got completely raked over the coals on Twitter because uh, I was doing the uh, Twitter play-by-play for Sure Dog, and I'm apparently the only person in the universe that thought Volkanovski won the first round. So people were just destroying me for the rest of the evening. But that's the thing about this fight. There are some fights where, you know, one fighter wins at three rounds to two, and there's nothing controversial about it. You know, there were two rounds that were very clear cut for one fighter, three that were very clear cut for the other. In this fight, probably four of the five rounds were tough to score. Yeah, I, I totally agree. One thing I, I didn't like is I didn't like Michael Bisman's commentary during this. Uh, he was he was all over Holloway. He made it sound like Holloway was way up, that uh, you know Volkanovski needed this huge comeback. No, I gave Holloway the first two rounds. I, I gave um, – I think Holloway won the first two rounds – Fairly convincingly, the fifth round. I know, obviously, you said you didn't give it to Holloway. The fifth round, yeah. I thought, was pretty convincing for Volkanovski. The fourth round, I leaned Volkanovski. It came to me down to the third round. It is razor close. I feel like that fight, that round, I could watch it ten times, and I'd probably score it five for Holloway and five times for Volkanovski. It is, it is as close of a MMA fight as uh, as you can say. Um, when the thing that stood out to me, it was right after the second round. Like I said, I had Holloway up to nothing. The commentators had Holloway up to nothing. Holloway had himself up to nothing. And he's pointing up two like this, two in a row. Alex Volkanovsky is so mentally strong. And what I mean by that, and it's something I wrote down early and I forgot to mention on the round table. I want to go back to the Chad Mendes fight. People forget Chad Mendes almost knocked out 
Volkanovski. He dropped Volkanovski, was going for kill, actually had his back at one point, and Volkanovski scrambled and then like got pissed off and came after Chad Mendes and basically broke Chad Mendes to the point where Chad Mendes folded and then retired. His yep. next fight, he goes into Brazil against the king of Rio, goes into Rio de Janeiro, gets the king of Rio, Jose Aldo, gets the biggest one at that time, the biggest one of his career. Um, those two showed me how mentally strong it was. But then in this fight, you're down 2 nothing, and then to rally around and on the judges' scorecard, win the next three rounds, um, that takes a lot. Uh, that's why I'm so impressed by Alex Volkanovsky. W- what do you think on the, from the X's and O's? What, what stood out to you? He uh, X's and O's, the, the thing is, and you know we'll be getting to uh, Jan versus Aldo next, I picked the three title fights correct, but in each one, the guy that I picked to lose did much better than I expected. Like, I expected Usman to steamroll Masvidal. I expected Volkanovsky to at least beat Holloway more convincingly than he did the first time. But he didn't. And I was just, I was dead wrong in how I expected the dynamic here to work out. I expected that Holloway's compromised camp would hurt his cardio. And I thought it would rob him of opportunities to make adjustments in his game to counter the things that Volkanovsky used to beat him the first time. I was wrong on both counts. He did not fade in the later rounds. Like Volkanovsky won the the later rounds, but it's not because Holloway was like flagging and, and running out of gas. Just Volkanovsky just started edging him out, you know, just beating him to the punch by that that split second. Volkanovsky was still trying the the leg kicks, but Holloway like Holloway was just able to kind of shrug him off. He he checked a, a few more of them. He switched stances at opportune times a couple times and just seemed to take less damage. They just weren't as daunting. Like, uh, really, really impressive performance by Holloway. It is a shame that such a good performance by both guys leaves them in a situation where it one guy is 2-0 and because it would take a whole lot now for there to be interest in a trilogy fight, even though, man, I'd, I'd watch these guys fight again next week. Yeah, no. So from X and O stance, this is the one that I was most excited about. Um, it was funny because a lot of people weren't excited about this rematch, but from uh, X and O stance, I really liked it. And it really delivered to me. Uh, the reason why I believe Holloway won those early rounds is he did very well at keeping Volkanovski, forcing, uh, forcing him to fight back up, forcing him to fight off his back foot, and he kept him at the end of his punches very well. Why it changed is as the fight went on, Volkanovski started using a lot more lateral movement, kind of getting not so much Holloway to walk him down, but more Holloway to chase him. And then he did a good job at bouncing and getting into the, his range, getting inside the pocket where he could do damage. Um, and I think that's what really uh, won him the fight. Uh, but like I said, this fight is so close. I think I, I saw someone say it was best for the UFC if Volkanovski won. I disagree. I think it would have been best for Holloway to win because you still have the trilogy fight. You still have another guy. Um, you, you know, you can do. You know, I, I wouldn't do the trilogy oh. right away. But uh, Max Holloway is in a very, very tough situation now. Now that he's lost two in a row, he's lost three of his last four. Um, I really don't know what to do with him. Uh, but let's let's go this. Let's let's talk about um, the, the let's talk about featherweight altogether because it's, it, it's such an interesting division because. Most divisions, there's either a clear-cut next guy or one or two next guys. Featherweight is wide open. I mean, do you think some of the options, uh, you have Yair Rodriguez, you have uh, Zabit, Megamed, Sheripov, you have the Korean Zombie, you got Josh Emmett. Like, there's all all these guys. I mean, there's probably one or two other guys I'm not thinking of. All these guys have a claim. Brian Ortega. All these guys have a claim to be next. So... All right, you're Alex Volkanovski, and and uh, you're UFC, and you got to match him up against somebody. Who are you putting uh, Volkanovski? You know he's gotten past Max Holloway. That's done. Who's he? Who should he fight next? If he wants a little time on the shelf to recuperate, you know wh- whatever he wants. Uh, assuming Yair and Zabit are still fighting in August, give him the winner of that. You know around around the end of the year. If he wants back in quick. Let's see if Korean Zombie is available. Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 literally the exact thing yeah. I was going to say. That was the exact yeah. thing I said. I I, I think uh, yeah yeah Rodriguez uh, here he has a win over the Korean Zombie. I know he was, he was losing got last second. So if you needed 
someone come back and, and you don't have the Zabit fight, then yeah, maybe you just go with Yair Yair. But if you book that Zabit and you want to have Volkanovski wait, I, I totally agree. Especially if Yair Yair, if Yair Yair wins and he's got wins over Zabit and the Korean Zombie, he'd actually lead. If, if Zabit wins, I think he's probably the most marketable one of the, of everyone on the, the ones we mentioned. Um, Josh Emmett is kind of, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago. We talked about Josh Emmett. I think that'd be the funnest matchup, especially from an X and O sense. Um, two bulls who throw hard, who don't like to give ground. Uh, but as he he was tweeting, he he was doing his best trying to get that fight. But unfortunately, he's on the shelf. He's he's injured. He was throwing out March. Like that's probably they're probably oh. not going to wait that long. Um, and that's even if he can come back that soon. So I think Josh Emmett is out. Um, Dude, his knee was his knee was toast after that last fight. And that last fight was what? Was it like two weeks ago? Yeah, I think March might be. That's like Tony Ferguson type recovery. Like that. Yeah. That might be being nice. Um, I, but sometimes you're better off just tweeting, just keeping your name, even if you can't take the fight, just keep your name in the mix. Uh, let's talk about Holloway because Holloway is interesting. Like I've seen some people think he should move up to lightweight. Uh, to me, you know, he's in that kind of Joseph Benavides. John Fitch, what a, you know, the list of guys who've lost to a champion twice. Um, he's kind of stuck at featherweight until Alex Volkanovsky loses. But to me, a lot of the guys that Max Holloway has beaten while he was at featherweight, they're all gone. They've all moved on or passed their primes. Frankie Edgar, Anthony Pettis, Ricardo Lamas, all the rest of these top contenders, they're all still there. And they're guys that Max Holloway has never faced. And regardless of losing you know, three of his last four, Max Holloway is someone that I'm still very interested in watching. Um, oh. I oh. really, I, and we've talked about this many times when we talked about the featherweight division. It's just such a great division. I think Max Holloway versus the winner of Dan Ige versus Calvin Cater. How fun would that be? Now, Ige that- might not, might, Ige might happen because of the, the connection with Hawaii and whatnot, but if Calvin Cater wins, which I am picking him to beat Dan Ige, what a fan match. <laughs> That's the fight I want to see. Holloway, <laughs> Calvin Cater. And the thing is, uh, you know, I've I've had the the good fortune to talk to Danny Gay a couple times. I've interviewed him a few times uh, for the site over the phone as well as in person. It, one, I mean, he definitely has all kinds of respect for for Holloway. You know, has respect for all the greats of Hawaiian MMA. But from very early in his career, he is not trained in Hawaii. He's been an extreme sure. guitar for a long time. And two. That dude is all business. Yeah. Like, he would absolutely fight Holloway, and that would be a, a huge opportunity for him. Sure. Just because Featherweight is so crowded that if you're in that group that's kind of bubbling around in the cauldron between, uh, say, 8th and 15th in the in the division, it's rare that you get a chance to fight someone who's in that, like, 3-7 to seven spot who's not, like, falling precipitously. So I, I imagine he'd jump at that. I, I don't know if that's too much of a jump for Ige from like the UFC's perspective. I tell you this, the guy already has a dance partner, but I would give a nut. Well, I probably shouldn't say that after this card, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to see Holloway versus Zabit Magomed Sharipov, like that would just be an absolutely insane fight. Yeah, uh, I think Holloway's I... got all kinds of, the thing is, I mean, Holloway is, I mean, he's been a champion and he looked like the world was his oyster and he's had a couple of setbacks. But he's also, like, become a very beloved fighter. He's a guy where even if he, like, retreats back and he's never really in title contention again, he could settle into that sort of Donald Cerrone role where, I mean, his health his health allowing, eight years from now, he's still just, like, a bonus-collecting machine and a tough out in whatever division he's fighting in. I doubt he sees himself that way. I'm sure he sees himself as a champ who's just like been temporarily displaced, the question would just be whether he wants to do it at 155 or 145. Yeah. Uh, going back to the Dan Ige thing, if Dan Ige, if they really to put that on, I mean, Bellator has been able to do it. I know the UFC hasn't been able to do it, but if they can get a card in Hawaii, I mean, how great of a, you know, you can do a fight night, you don't have to do a pay-per-view. You get Holloway versus Ige in the main event. Um, that says, I, I'm talking up Ige. I don't think Ige is going to win. I think Calvin K is going to beat him, which that's a matchup against Max Hollywood. Oh. That I would love to see. Uh, but how about let's do this before we move on. Let's talk about if Holloway moves up to lightweight because that's been an option. He talked about it. Um, how about Tony Ferguson? Book it. Book it. <laughs> Take my money. 
<laughs> like, uh, I mean, book it, it and take my money. I mean, Holloway's had one fight at lightweight in the UFC, and it was against someone who was a really, really dreadful uh, matchup for him. You know, like Poirier. Just sure, sure. He, he wasn't. He wasn't going to be able to get Poirier out of there by doing Max Holloway things. But it doesn't mean that he wouldn't immediately just slot in and be a top ten, if not top five, lightweight, and probably get a title shot. Yeah, you know, yeah. Give me him versus Ferguson. I mean, you, there's other great matches you could do. Hooker, uh, Paul Felder's guy. He's, you know, talking about retirement. Yeah. He's, he says that he's you know he only wants to come back for guys that excite yeah. him. I imagine Max Hollywood would excite him. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of matchups for Max Holloway. Yeah. Hooker, Barboza, either of those guys versus, you know, Hook uh, would be a fantastic fight with Holloway. Charles DeBronx. I, probably not DeBronx because DeBronx is like on a long win streak. You know, he's he just needs to win one or two more and probably get a title shot. But yeah, like we, we, tons, we, saw, we saw that fight once, though. It was that weird thing with with uh, Oliveira's neck and everything. Remember? That, that, that doesn't. Yeah, that yeah. doesn't. Yeah, his esophagus yeah. rupture, whatever the hell he said it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of whatever the hell we said it was, uh, the third title fight, we have a new champion from uh, Serbia. He is Petra Jan. I'm going to butcher his first name as much time as I, I, I know people call him Peter Jan, but that's not actually how you pronounce it. I'm trying to get it right. I can't get it right. He beat um, somehow not the consensus greatest featherweight of all time, according to uh, John Anik and Joe Rogan, who everybody else I know considers him the – Goat, uh, Jose Aldo. Uh, really fun fight until, you know, the finish. It was, you know, fairly competitive until the, you know, the championship rounds. Um, Yan is an absolute, uh, Yan is an absolute sniper. I mean, his, uh, he just, his, like, he, he's good with everything he throws is good. Like, I haven't found a thing that he isn't good. The one thing that really concerns me is he comes from a boxing background. And he fights like a guy because of the background, like he has twelve rounds and not five rounds. Because he, like the second round, he just gave him the second round away. Like he was, le- mm-hmm. he was looking for things. He was, and just kind of like put it in cruise. And that happens a lot in boxing. Like guys can give rounds away. Maybe they put out too much output in the first round. It's like, all right, I'm gonna give this round up. Um, and 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 that really worries me as a champion. Um, you know, we talked about Volkanovski Holloway, their first fight. Holloway, I felt like he really gave the first two rounds away uh, in the Volkanovski fight, and it was like he ran out of time. You know, before time he kind of said putting it together in their first fight, he, you know, he had to play catch up. That's something Jan would have to do. If, you know, if he gives away rounds. Um, but what was really impressing me is where the fight was pretty close. When Jan turned it up, you saw how much better. He was in Jose Aldo, especially just from that pure, you know, Jose Aldo's been around. I mean, one guy's 27, the other guy's, you know, mid 30s, been in wars. His ability to be able to turn it up, to me, Aldo couldn't come up to that next level. Well, Jan, based on his youth and his ability, he could. Uh, What stood out to you? Just that, again, you know, all three of the title fights, I picked them right, but the ones I picked against did better than I expected. This is the one that looked closest. To the way I expected it. Uh, I mean, I think I literally said on the the round table that I expected Jan to either, you know, win pulling away or even finish Aldo late after maybe losing the first round. He he ended up winning the first round, but then lost the second. But the the basic idea was that Aldo's generally a quick starter, and uh, Jan can be a slow one. But it's the second round he kind of, you know didn't have quite the output, but yeah, in the championship rounds, either just cause Yan had another gear that Aldo did not, or that Aldo was getting tired, probably a combination of the two. Yeah. The fourth round was extremely clear cut. And then the fifth was just a death March. That thing could have been, you know, could have been stopped several times uh, for sure. It was just brutal. And Aldo so tough, so much heart and able not just to survive, but, Man, every time Leon Roberts said move or I'm going to stop this fight, he moved. Yeah. It was yeah, I mean the guy just has no quit in him. Uh so huge respect to Jose Aldo Jr., but that was that felt like a changing of the guard moment there. Yeah, totally. I go back to the Leon Edwards. I, I mean, uh, sorry, Leon Roberts. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Yeah, Aldo did move when he told him to. 
I just think Robert's given too many opportunities to move. Like I felt like he let mm-hmm. that go on too long. Um, back to, to to Jan. I mean, this guy is so calculated with his striking, and we haven't seen his ground game. But if you go back to his days at Fight Nights Global and stuff, he's a very good grappler. Um, his one loss is a fantastic fight against uh, Mega Man Mega Manoff, another guy that probably should be fighting the UFC, and then he avenged that loss. And I thought he won that fight. So like, I think this guy could be undefeated. Um, uh, Jose Aldo, though. There was some. There was really good moments as you talked about. Like he's he's still a great body puncher. He attacks the body really well, and then he suddenly added light kicks in again. Josie Aldo with light kicks is a, is an exciting guy. Well, he's definitely not in his prime anymore. Josie Aldo is not shot. Like he is still competitive. Like he'll never. I shouldn't say never, but it's it's extremely unlikely that Jose Aldo will ever hold a UFC title again. That said. He is the perfect guy to either match up against other veterans as a fun legacy type fight or that guy who's rising up as a test. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have think I'd be sitting where I am now saying I still want to see Jose Aldo fight. But yeah, I still want to see him fight. And I think he's interesting and he looks better at 135. I still don't know if the power went with him down to 135. Uh, but I mean, two fights in a row where I thought he was going to get smashed – he had moments in both fights, both the Marlon Marais. There's a lot of people who thought he beat Marlon Marais. And then in this fight was, you know, two or three. I mean, even the third round, I, mean, I gave him the second round. The third round, I gave to Jan, but it was close. It was like a toss-up round. Like almost um, heading into the fifth round, Jose Aldo's team had a 2-2. I had a 3-1, but either way, that to be that competitive was impressive. So let's talk about – let's do some matchmaking. Um, I think this is the – of the three title fights, champions, I think this is the easiest one to matchmake uh, for Peter Jan. It's got to be Aljamain Sterling. If it's not Aljamain Sterling, I think the the hardcore fans will will riot or something because there really is nobody else that deserves it more than Aljamain Sterling. Yeah, and Jan more or less verbally acknowledged that on the mic afterwards, which I I hope they stick with that because the thing is, it's not like Aljamain is some boring dude that they're burying just because they don't want to have to put him on TV. Aljo's an exciting fighter. And he's a pretty like funny and animated dude. I, I it's gonna be a great build up to the fight, and it should be a great fight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only guy that I could see the UFC thinking about doing is is Cody Garbrandt because he's you know former champion, he's remarkable. But I really, really don't expect it. I think they'll probably give Sterling the fight. And like you said, like Sterling is great. Like he's a great fighter. He's great on the mic. Like I don't get why they don't want to put a marking push behind him. Um, the other guy that no one mentioned that just popped in my head this last like five seconds is if something happened to Jan where they keep, say he missed out, had to sit out for on the shelf for say six months. Mm-hmm. TJ Dillashaw is is back to Spencer in six months. I mean, he never lost a belt. Uh, I could see, I could see him. You know, I I would rather see him. You know, win a fight, and but that's always an option. Oh, absolutely. There's, I mean, there are basically three former champs just kind of hovering over the proceedings, any of whom is really close to another title shot. You you mentioned Garbrandt. Dillashaw is eligible to come back in January, January assuming yeah. nothing changes. And obviously the UFC is treating Cejudo's retirement as legitimate. They've already filled the belt, but Cejudo can't stay off the Twitters like no. taunting these guys. No, that's and right. N- nobody thinks this is permanent. So if Cejudo was just doing this to kind of like, you know, take a year off even, if Cejudo says next March, hey, I'm back, unless the current champ at that point is someone he's already fought, they may just slot him straight into a title shot. Yeah. I mean, how how can you deny the two-division champ that? That's absolutely right. Yeah. So so going back to what I said about Sterling, I feel like Sterling is absolutely next, but for some reason, the UFC gets in some contract agreement with Henry Cejudo. I changed my opinion. Henry Cejudo was a guy who had the title. So as much as I – Sterling has done everything that he – possible to deserve the title shot. If Cejudo comes back, Cejudo to me is one because, I mean, <laughs> I mean there's still people out there who's going to say, well, Jan's not really the champion. Cejudo is. So uh, obviously that's the fight. Uh, let's talk about Jose Aldo real quick. Um, months ago, I really br- – I brought up the – it was I think it was on Around the Cage. I threw up the name Dominic Cruz. I'd like to see that matchup. Uh, I, I like it even more now. Who 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 would you like to see Aldo against next? If Cruz wants to keep fighting, I love that. Otherwise, any top 10 135 are coming off a loss. Give me 
Sandhagen. Give me Pedro Munoz. Either of those guys, because Aldo needs a little bit of a step back. I mean, you can't just give the greatest uh, featherweight of all time just another dude. Yeah. So what are you gonna do? But, with, what are you gonna do with Aldo though? Because you're talking about Max Holloway, right? No, I'm talking about Aldo. No, but you said greatest featherweight. The consensus is well, Max Holloway, according to Joe Rogan. Oh, good grief. <laughs> according to Joe Rogan and John Anik and, and nobody else I know. Everybody else I know calls it uh, calls it uh, Jose Aldo, but somehow Max Holloway gets thrown in there. I mean, f- for all we know, Aldo is one of the top five bantamweights in the world right now, and we just don't know because he's fought. <laughs> he very well could be. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Sandhagen and, and Munoz are like, they've both lost. But they're both still top 10 Bantamweights. They're both still really dangerous guys, very much, you know, in their primes or not even in their primes yet. Let's see what, you know, let's see what the the old man can do with them. All right. And talking about former champions, we had a a fight that really bothered me. And that's just because I picked Jessica Andrade to win. Uh, Rose <laughs> Namunas got her revenge against Jessica Andrade. She won a split decision. In a in a really fun fight, but what bothers me, I don't mind getting fights wrong. I mean, I get fights wrong all the time. What bothers me is how Jessica Andrade lost. Uh, the peekaboo style, I loved. I loved the head move, the peekaboo style, the Mike Tyson style, a uh, boxing style. But if you're going to do the peekaboo, you don't do it from out at range and let Rose Namunas pick you up for two rounds and then stop bouncing in range and throw you. like. Her pressure, I still believe this, her pressure in the first round is what got her that slam knockout. If she used the peekable style to get in to get, and, and then like she did in the third round, her physicality is a big issue for Rose Namunas. We saw it in the third round. She almost knocked her out. Um, I just felt like she gave the first two rounds away, and it drove me crazy. And I was like, oh, man. It's like nobody was picking Jessica Andrade. I would have felt like a genius if I picked her right. Um, tell me why I'm an idiot for not taking her. You're not an idiot at all. I was surprised at her approach to the fight. She didn't really seem to have any urgency to get it on the floor. Certainly didn't have any urgency to get the same kind of high amplitude slam that she was going for repeatedly in the first fight. I did like the peekaboo, you know, g- giving us a a little Floyd Patterson there, which, you know, obviously it that is an approach that was built for the short, shorter fighters, but it only works if you're using it while you're within your punching range to be able to throw stuff back. Because the thing is, it really did throw Nami Yunus off, especially in the first round, round and a half. Because the first round of their first fight, Nami Yunus' jab was just stapled to Andrade's face. She was hitting her basically every single time she wanted to. She was having trouble finding Andrade in the early going. But when she would miss, Andrade wasn't always close enough to counter and make her pay. So instead of Andrade marking Nami Yunus up, Nami Yunus just kind of won a slow paced first round. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a weird two fights. If you mix them all, if, you, if we could just take the two fights and mix them all together uh, and have all their best skills come out, I think it would have been a, like fight of the year candidate. But somehow Rose Nami Yunus did better in the first fight and, lo- and lost, and then worse in the second fight and won. Completely. Uh, and then. You know, she's the only person I know that gets knocked out in a fight where she is the underdog, gets knocked out, returns, and is a big favorite. <laughs> like, um, but let's talk about Rose Nami Yunus. Um, as far as Jessica Andrade, well, hold on. Actually, I want to move on. I don't want to move on. What's the one thing about Jessica Andrade? I felt like she watched the first fight and she said, okay, here's all the things I did wrong. Let's not do that. And she, like, took out all the things she did right. And she's like, I'm just going to fix the things I did wrong. Completely ignore mm-hmm. the thing she did right, and I I don't know I I don't I hated the strategy I hated her cornering she went back to the corner they told her she was up two nothing I hated that yeah um, um. I, I I don't know um over to Rose Rose look exactly how I expect Rose she's she's got, she's a great striker she's good at what she does she doesn't like pressure the way to beat Rose not is to pressure to use physicality to make an ugly fight um, but if you give her space. She is very, very good. She doesn't have a lot of tells. Um, she's quick. Um, her jab is very good. Might be one of the best jabs in women's MMA. Um, there's a lot to like about Rose Nami Yunus. Is anything I'm missing that, that jumped out to you? No. I mean, that was a very good Rose Nami Yunus performance. She, if you don't push her out of her comfort zone and the things she does best, you're going to lose. It's just a matter of whether you, you lose pretty or ugly. 
Yeah. You know, like if you if you fight at her range on the feet, you know, or and Andrade didn't do much of this. If you just take down, take her down, and and try to you know chip at her from her guard, you're gonna get armbarred or you're gonna get swept. But yeah, just Andrade didn't do enough to force uh, Nami Yunus out of her comfort zone. The things that she wants to do. Yeah, the one thing I'll say about Rose Namiya's watch I, I, that I was impressed by, the fact that when Jessica Andrade did get in the rage and beat her up, the fact that she still had the mental capacity to make it through that round to survive, like, that's a good thing. Like, I think that's better for her career than if she just had a clean three-round fight. The third round was a, another outside kickboxing range, and she just cruises without any adversity. I think the adversity is a good thing. Like, it makes me, that makes me higher on Nami Yunus than if it was just a clean fight. So let's talk about what's next with these, uh, uh, these two. It seems like, uh, Rose Nami Yunus is uh, everyone's talking about the Whaley Zhang fight. I'm 100 okay with that. Um, Tatiana Suarez is probably the only other option. Tatiana Suarez is dealing with a back injury. We no one knows when she'll return. Uh, Rose Nami Yunus is the bigger name, uh, the you know former champion. I think it'd be a really fun fight. It's one of the ones with this pre pre tape study. I'm like 50 50 on who wins that fight, which that's what I love. Um, mm-hmm. Do you see it any other way? Uh, talking about Nami Yunus and and Whaley. Yeah, like do you see all well, the well, two part two part. Do you see anybody else? Like who who should Rose fight? Is she should she be the next for the title? She should. I mean, okay. if they want to slide Suarez in there, just as someone who hasn't really been into the title picture yet and was just a, a new and different look, I could understand them doing that. But I would rather they run Nami Yunus in there now and. The UFC kind of recognizes her low key star status slash star potential. I don't think they're going to bury Nami Yunus if if they can justify putting her into a title fight. I like that a lot. I mean, Zhang is a very good striker, very well rounded. She's not quite the physical brute that Andrade is, but she'll definitely be able to bully Nami Yunus if if you know she can get her hands on her. So that's a, a different challenge uh, for, for you know, Rose to have to deal with. Yeah, I was just thinking about how fun stylistically that matchup would be. And then we started talking about Tatiana Suarez, and I was like, wow, how fun would that matchup be against Rose? Like the, the nonstop pressure of Tatiana and then, the you know, the slick submission and striking ability of Rose. It, that's just a, that, Of all the women's division, that's definitely the best one. It's most exciting. Um yeah, it nice to see, you know, I picked Jessica Andrade and I was one of the few people who did, but it was nice to see Rose get back in there. And and honestly, like, I wouldn't mind seeing a, a, a trilogy fight down the road if they, you know, for some reason, if Rose isn't the champion. And I'd like to see it five rounds in, uh, like, a, like a fight night, like a main event. Um, I felt like Andrade was fighting like this was a five-round fight instead of a three-round fight, uh, but we'll move on. Uh, talk about a fight that did not need to go deep in it, and that was... Uh, Paige Van Zant versus Amanda Hivas. Amanda Hivas got a first round submission of Paige Van Zant. Uh, I was so big on, on Amanda Hivas heading into this fight. I mean, she was a n- negative nine hundred favorite, so I think everybody was huge on her. Um, but she's now four zero in the UFC. She absolutely steamrolled Paige Van Zant. Kind of picked apart from range, got a takedown. Um, her um, her transition. She went from body lock to like a takedown, and then. You know, was beating her up. There was a little scramble. Went right to the uh, arm bar. It was the same arm bar that Paige Van Zant uh, broke. Oh no! So it wasn't a bar. Like it was, it was a hip toss. It was a headlock. It was like uh, the head and arm throw. That's what it was. Yep. And then in the scramble, got the uh, arm. But she, when it looked like Paige Van Zant was going to come out, what they call it, coming out the back door. What she did, uh, he bossed threw her legs over, hips over, got the arm bar. It was absolutely slick. Uh, forcing Paige Van Zandt to tap. What I'm impressive is not that Amanda Hebos beat Paige Van Zandt. It was the fact that she was got her out there that quick. I mean, you think about the other girls that have beaten up Paige Van Zandt. Nobody's able to do that to her like that bad. Like Michelle Waterson was able to get her that quick. Uh, Rose Namunis was not able to get her that quick. Um, I, I'm I'm through the roof on this Amanda Hebos. How are you feeling about this match? Uh, Hebos did exactly what you're supposed to do when you're a uh, plus, you know, minus. 750 minus 800 minus 900 favorite you're expected to win if you want to make a good impression if you want your stock to go up you need to make the other person look like they don't even belong in the cage with you she did that i mean this was a classic piece of kind of 
fuck you goodbye matchmaking from the UFC where, you know, if you're going to fight out your contract, they're going to do what they can to, you know, make sure you don't make a good impression on the way out, kind of hurt your your stock going forward. But even so, he was beat her worse than I expected and just mauled her physically because the thing and I even said this uh, leading up to the fight on on our roundtable. The one thing Van Zandt's always had going for her is that she's a physically strong athletic you know woman like usually when when she's wanted to she's been able to bully other fighters around even here with Hebus you know fighting up from her usual weight class he was flung her to the ground with that you know that head and arm throw which normally is just the worst thing ever it's the worst takedown you know it's really common in women's divisions but, but the reason it usually sucks is that more than half the time the woman who gets thrown ends up you know either in mounts or on the other woman's back just because you've got them down there and basically they're already on your back he was for, for one thing tried to finish it just by holding on to her and keeping it as a scarf hold and you know like bleeding out of her nose all over page which was really gross uh but then yeah when van zant tried to scramble to get out uh he was his finish was fantastic the the way she just you know Stepped over, got the armbar, went belly down, and Van Zandt just looked so deflated at the end of it. You know, she just realized that she'd been thoroughly beaten in in, in a technical sense. Yeah, the only thing more impressive than Hebas's performance is maybe her mic skills. I mean, she has that too. Like, she's super fun. Like, she's such a big bundle of joy. Like, we were having, like I said, I had friends over. We were having fun with, uh, you know, her her post fight. Uh, speech or whatever post fight interview uh she's so much fun uh, as far as Paige van zant being her last fight in the ufc it's i mean I think pretty much everyone is settled on they're not gonna she's not gonna be back in the ufc she'll either not fight anymore or probably go on to bellator where her husband uh, fights um it couldn't have been better for the ufc the fact that they're taking out that quick on a big pay-per-view like she is like ruined goods like here you go you can have her she's not that good anymore um i mean that's what they wanted that's what they got which I mean, I I understand why they do it from a you know business perspective. I I don't even hate it that bad. That's that's what they're trying to do. They're you know they're in competition with these other promotions. They're not trying to give them you know they're, they're not trying to give them the the good stuff. They're trying to give them the day old bread. So you know I understand why it happened and it absolutely worked this time. Yeah, and I mean they take a chance. They take a chance by putting her on a pay per view. And like, no, imagine if she wins. If she won that matchup. It would have backfired in the UFC. She would have been, her stock would have been even higher. Um, they probably would have just resigned her for for more money and just said, uh, "Well, well, yeah, you know. yeah." Or they would at least maybe it might have been a positive. They had to drive up the price on her for Bellator. But um, I, I want to do one more matchmaking. I, I I don't know if you were expecting me to do matchmaking. This Amanda Hebos. Uh, I think about the division. We talked about how div- good the division is. To me, there's like a like a tier at the top. Like ones we were talking about: no, Nami Yunus, Ray Li Zhang. Ioana, Tatiana Suarez, um, Andrade, maybe even Claudia Gadea. Like, I don't want her to face those people yet. And I don't even want to face, like, the next tier down because she's so young. Like, I don't want her to go against Michelle Watterson next or Carl Suspenser oh. or something like that. Like, I want her to oh. go down to third tier. Like, I want to still wow. – like, I want her to go against, like, Carolina Kovacavich. Oh, like, man. Someone who still has a name, someone she'll still look spectacular. And then, like, you get by that and then move up. Tell, you're, so you you sound like you're you want to throw it up higher. You're much nicer than me. Okay. Uh yeah, I I'm I'm I was ready to throw her to the wolves. I was like, "Oh yeah, you know, you know, give me someone like, you know, Cynthia Calvillo." But uh but I I'd, I'd also be fine with her getting more seasoning. She is very young. Yeah. Calvillo uh, even moved though, up though. Don't forget Calvillo moved up. Her last fight was Oh, you you are right. But I mean, like I, you take like a Michelle Watterson, like that. That I could see them doing that matchup next. Like two young, I mean, Watterson's not young, but two pretty girls. Although they love doing the pretty girls matchup, uh, I could, I could see that match. I would favor Hebos in that fight. Hmm. I mean, if they if they want to match her with somebody that has a very recognizable name and is definitely kind of like off her prime, but you know, did win her last fight. You know, you got Tisha Torres. Yeah, that would make sense. 
and she's coming off a good win. I mean, uh, uh, Brianna Van Buren was a girl that I liked a lot, and she she easily beat Brianna Van Buren. Because, because otherwise, I mean, it works out to Hebus's advantage that so much of the strawweight top ten already has a next fight. You know, a lot of those people are tied up, so there's sure. less risk of her just getting fast tracked to something mm-hmm. that she's not ready for yet. Yeah, and I can't see like. I don't expect him to go too high with her. Like I can't see them putting him against Yuana next. Like I can't see him do that. No, and no, no, please. no, no. Would you want to? What, what benefit would that do for her? Uh, let's. And so, guys, we covered the main card. Let's move on to the prelims. We'll go a little bit quicker on the prelims. Uh, the but the main the headlining prelim fight was a fight that had a lot of implications, especially in the ranking sense. We saw uh, Yuri Parzaska, the reigning Ryzen champion, knock out Vulcan Ustamir in the second round. Um, People are going crazy by this knockout. People were very excited. I am on the fence. I saw some good. I saw some bad. The good, the good is what we said. We already talked about. He has fast hands. He throws some weird angles. He's got really good power. He cuts. He turns angles really well. Um, he's long. The bad. He still pulls his head straight back up. Um, he's still way too heavy. Away. While he throws punches at weird angles, he keeps his hands low, which leaves him available. Um, Volkanovski was having a good. Fairly easy time in the first round, piecing him up, almost knocked him out in the first round, had him hurt. Um, I'm still probably on the – I'm not that impressed since with Yuri Przeska. Where are you? Are you on one side of the fence or the other? It is rare that you have a fight that ends with a spectacular knockout, and I came away feeling worse about both fighters. But that's pretty much where we're at. I, I'm with you. Like, Przeska – he just goofed around too much. You know, he's, he's always had a, a little bit of kind of whimsy to his game, you know, kind of Anderson Silva type stuff where he's like, ah, let me just do this weird thing for a minute and see if it distracts the other guy. But he didn't just have his hands low. He had his hands like at his waist, like he was going to like hook his thumbs in his belt and like do a boot scoot and boogie. Like yeah. I have no idea what the hell he was doing. And it worked because he was coming up with like straight punches and jabs that were just coming from below Uzdemir's uh, field of vision, but yeah, he got dinged up good. And I said when we were breaking down this card in advance, I was like, I don't care how badly Uzdemir wins the first round. If they're sitting on their stools after five minutes, put all your money on Prochaska. Uh, I I expected it to come later, just as Uzdemir's gas tank went, but not surprised at all. Uh, welcome to the UFC, Prochaska. You arrived. You knocked the hell out of a top ten light heavyweight. So. You're in the deep end of the pool now, but the antics that he did in the first round are going to get him crushed in his next, like in his very next fight if he keeps doing that. Yeah, I think a guy guy like Dominic Reyes or Tiago Santos would hurt him bad if they did that. Um, Volkanovic Samara seems like we're both the same sense. You you made a very good call that if if it gets by the first round, bet against Volkanovic Samara. We start again. Um, That is becoming more and more the narrative with that guy. It just seems like a huge hole in his game. Um, I said, I don't want to match make anymore. Let's do one more matchmaking. Uh, Yuri Przaska. Let's, what, where would you like to see him? Who, who, who cares? But uh, Przaska, I thought of Corey Anderson. Um, who, who would you like to see him going against? Uh, Corey Anderson works uh, for me. He, he Przaska can't take a step back. Yeah. After, after knocking out a, a ranked guy. Yeah. So yeah, I, Corey Anderson works for me. Like they just booked Teixeira versus um. Cool. Yeah, um, Tiago Santos. Versus Santos. So th- those guys are booked up. Uh, Alexander Rakic just lost to Uzdemir, so I can't see them making that one, even sure. though it's a- an appropriate fight competitively. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you probably just predicted what they're yeah. going to do. Yeah, I saw a lot of people throwing Johnny Walker's name out there because of the styles, like they both kind of. Where it sounds, but Walker's on a two-fight losing streak. Like that doesn't make sense for a Przaska. I mean, I know Corey Anderson's on a losing streak, but Corey Anderson was one win away from getting a title shot. Like a lot of people thought Corey Anderson deserved a title shot. Um, but let's move on. We're talking about losing streaks. Um, I don't know where I'm transitioning. <laughs> let's see. <laughs> Seleski Dos Santos is on a one-fight losing streak as he lost a another very close uh, decision to Muslim Salikov. To me, this fight was. Uh, for two action strikers, this is a pretty boring uh, fight, in my opinion. Both guys, they weren't landing their spinning attacks. It was more of an outside kickboxing game. I actually scored at 29-28 for Dos Santos. Um, 
but uh, I'm okay with Muslim Salikov because I felt like neither guy was trying to secure the win. They would do, kind of do a point kickboxing match, and I understand why the um, the judges would give it to Salikov. When you're in the middle of the cage and you're the one marching forward, it always looks better for you. Um, mm-hmm. Though I do believe when there was hard strikes, it was coming from Dos Santos. That said, uh, how did you score this fight? I actually gave all three rounds to Dos Santos. Okay. Uh, I don't know how good I feel about giving the first round to him in hindsight, but I didn't have any, like, I didn't even have to think very hard about the second and third. I was shocked that one of the scorecards gave all three rounds to Salikov. Like, whoever did that should have been thrown off the island into the water. Like, that, like, what the hell? (laughs) Um, so I'm, I'm not mad at the decision in general. Because kind of like the Holloway fight, there were just a couple of individual rounds that were hard to score. You know, reasonable minds can differ on that stuff. But yeah, and and, and the fight itself was a bit of a, a letdown. I mean, we expected more spinning shit to be perfectly frank and we didn't get it. But it was a good kickboxing match. Kind of just a medium paced thing where, you know, they were they were trying to hit each other and that was it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to spend too much any more time on this fight. Um, it is what it is. I don't think either guy had a good performance. Moving on, uh, Mac went on Connie had a great performance against Danny Henry. I think all three of us on the broadcast, uh, why can't we call it the broadcast, the roundtable, we kept saying how well, uh, how well stylistically we thought Danny Henry matched up against Mark went on Connie as in a fable sense for Connie. and um, he went out there and was fantastic. He got body lock. This is a transition. He got a body lock. Uh, as soon as he, as soon as they hit the mat, he jumped from the body lock to the guillotine. A scramble pursued, went to Anaconda, choked him out. Um, really good sportsmanship afterwards from Anaconda when he when yep. Danny Henry went out unconscious. I was really impressed. Like I said, I had two casual friends uh, friends with me who were watching. This is actually the fight, first fight they saw. They came in. They both said the same thing. Like, wow, that's pretty cool. The guy to lift up his legs and try to get his uh, gain consciousness. So Anaconda gained two two friends of mine will be fans of him now. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is what I expected. Did, did anything stand out to you? No, it turned out exactly like I would have predicted, not because I'm a genius, but just because Henry's best chance of winning is generally to get the fight to the floor, and Amar Khani was always going to just run game on him there. Yeah. Um, let's talk about – we just said a fight that was pretty predictable – I don't think anybody can predict what happened in the Leonardo uh, Santos Ramon Bogotov fight. Uh, we all picked Santos to win. Uh, he won by unanimous decision. He could have won by disqualification. Uh, this fight. He should have won by disqualification. <laughs> yeah, this fight got really, really uh, weird and uh, ugly. Um, on four different occasions, Bogotov committed a foul in the first round. He poked him in the eye. We'll give him a pass on that. It happens. In the third round, he. Struck, struck Santos in the groin twice. The first one, I actually the fight was over. Santos was on the ground for a really long time. Uh, when they finally continued the action, in about uh, less than a minute left of, in the fight or so, Bogatov hit a really, really bad knee to the downed opponent. It was, I mean, it wasn't one of these ones where they were transitioning. Like Santos was like on his knee for several seconds fighting, and then Bogatov just grabbed him. Said, "I'm going to grab him by the head, and I'm going to knee him in the head." Um, Luckily for Santos, he he won. He continues to be, I believe, he's undefeated in the UFC. Um, not, I don't. I mean, it was a good performance. He clearly won, uh, but despite all the falls. But at forty years old, I just feel like the he kind of missed his opportunity, especially in the lightweight division. Like, is it? I know Craig is really high on him. You were really high on him. To me, I can't get that high on a forty year old. Well, I mean, Craig is is uh, super high on him. I was super high on him a couple of years ago. I mean, you know, he wiped, you know, Anthony Rocco Martin and Kevin Lee, you know, uh, in the same year, you know, back in 2015. And yeah, he, I mean, he was already 35, but 35 is doable. He looked like the future. And then, yeah, he's fought three times since then, but always fun to watch. I made the comment on the sure dog Twitter, that that third round is the dirtiest round I've ever seen in the UFC that went the full five minutes. Oh, <laughs> like uh, it, yeah, I get you said, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you go, you've always say, got like, like you know, it, Wes give Sims. an eyeball or somebody would have, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, they, those I mean, guys you, get disqualified, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, like they didn't didn't end in, in a disqualification or yeah. didn't just end with somebody recovering from a, a terrible foul and just getting knocked out or knocking the other guy out. But yeah, that was the dirtiest full five minute round I've ever seen in the UFC in terms of just blatant and damaging fouls. Yeah, no, uh, Ramon Bogatov has did not gain many fans in his UFC debut. Um, no, like even like you know. Uh, Shaq Congo and Maximo Blanco were like sitting at home and going, Oh dude, too much. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I would still rather watch Ramon Bogatov commit fouls in the third round than rewatch Marcin Tybara versus Max and Christian. This fight was absolutely terrible. I was complimentary of Kamar Usman's fight, but, but, um, and Marcin Tybara had a very similar style, but for some reason it wasn't nearly as entertaining. Um, he was just bigger than Maxim Grisham. He used that advantage. He closed the distance, got a couple, he did get a takedown, but mostly just won in the clinch by pressing, uh, Grisham against the cage. Grisham had no answer. Uh, only thing I say is, um, Grisham's got to go back down to light heavyweight. And, uh, I hate watching Marcin Tybara fight. Do you have anything else to say? Nope. That's twice in a row that I have picked against Martin Tybura against a smaller guy because I picked Sergei, Sergei Spivak to wipe him out as well. And man, I'm just tired of it. I made the comment before the last card that the dude who put the, you know, five digits on Kay Hansen might be in for just a miserable night as he watches, you know, Jin Fry just slowly piece her up for 15 minutes. I felt that like that, that about this fight. Because pretty quickly I saw how it was going and I was like, oh man, I just got to watch my pick be wrong for like 15 slow minutes. It was awful. <laughs> yeah, that's how I felt about Jessica and Josh. But I, and and <laughs> I also picked Christian too, if we, if we remember. Um, but speaking of people losing bets, we, we, did, we forgot to mention the guy who dropped 20K on, on Jorge Masvidal right before the fight. Ooh, wow. I was, I'm assuming that guy's not hurting for money if he can drop 20K on uh on Jorge Masvidal, which clearly was a casual fan, because I didn't know many of the sharps that were on Jorge Masvidal. Uh, but we were just talking about Roman Bakatov and all the fouls he committed. I think uh, Highland Paiva should send like Bakatov some money, because everyone's talking about Bakatov's fouls and not the fouls <laughs> Highland Paiva committed on, uh, I'm going to butcher his name again, but Zalix, Juma Gulov. Um, mm -hmm. The fight was really close. It was not a robbery. I scored a 29-28 for Zumagulov, but I was okay with it going either way. I think I had first round Paiva, second round Zumagulov. I gave the third round Zumagulov, but it was a, I, I should have rewatched this fight. I did not rewatch this fight, um, but I was like okay. Like I remember being when the fight ended, I was like, man, I don't know who I'm, I'm going to give it to Zumagulov because he was pressing the action, and uh, but I was okay with uh, it going to Paiva despite all the fouls. One one thing I want to say is I saw some people saying, well, it should have went to Zumagulov because of all these fouls that. Paiva committed. A judge does not score a round based on if a guy committed fouls or not. Nope. They only take away points if the referee tells them to. Yep. So if I'm a judge and I'm watching that fight, though that knee to the groin never even happened because nope. the referee didn't tell me that it happened. He didn't tell me to take a point off. So um, yeah, guys, learn how to score. Uh, and I'm not saying learn how to score is if you scored it for one guy or the other because I was 50-50 on it. But I mean, just you, when you score a fight, a illegal foul has nothing to do with the fight unless the referee says to. Um, anyways, the question is, how did you score this fight? I scored it the same as you. In fact, all three of the scorers on the sure dog play-by-play -play scored it 29-28 uh, for Jumagulov, giving Paiva the first round and Jumagulov the second and third. I picked him in advance of the fight. I thought, you know, I, I, th I still think he's a very legit prospect. I still believe in him. It just... He didn't start doing the things I thought he was going to do to win the fight until well into the second round. Uh, and I still gave him the fight. But if he'd, if he'd done that from the beginning, I think he probably would have won all three rounds. And it wouldn't have even been a question of him, you know, not getting an iffy decision. Yeah. I actually, it's funny you say that because I do think the first round I felt like I saw a little jitters because he wasn't fighting. Usually he's pretty aggressive. Um he was being aggressive, but he was circling the outside of the cage, and that never looks good. And I think that's why Paiva won, because even though Paiva wasn't throwing as much, he was still taking the center, marching forward. And similar to the Sulikov, like I felt like that's what the judges were looking for. Um, yeah. Uh, let's, let's not, before we move on, let's not mention, uh, forget to mention that Paiva also missed weight uh, for this fight, so that doesn't help him either. Uh, before that fight, we had. Vanessa Mello versus Carol Rosa. Carol Rosa won a very um, 
a one-sided decision. Uh, the thing that stood out to me most was Michael Bisning mentioning how big <laughs> Vanessa Mello's thighs were. I, I enjoyed that in the fight. Uh, yeah, that <laughs> was, was interesting. Like, Come on, Mike. Like you can say that about a man. You can't say that. You can't say, "Oh man, look how big her thighs are," and then go, "Oh, I don't mean that as an insult." Uh, and uh, honestly, both of them have pretty, you know, they they have pretty thick lower bodies. You know, both both women got big legs. Like I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm just kind of describing it, but. Yeah, that w- that was a weird moment on the mic for for Bisping, you know. But I guess better than better that than flaming back and forth with uh, Dan Henderson on Twitter, which is how we spent yeah. the rest of the evening. <laughs> Good Lord. Oh, uh, I, I, I'm impressed with Rose. She so we talked about all the defensive uh, flaws that she has. I still think they're there, but her offensive game is is very impressive. She works a really nice job, and that, to have that tool in your game at a young at a young age, she's very young. Is is very promising. The other thing is her output is insane. Like like I yeah I don't have the numbers in front of me, but she was like throwing like it seemed like she was throwing ten punches for every single punch that Melo threw. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I like how Rosa. Like she's two and zero in the UFC now. Um, that is a very shallow division. <laughs> she could win another fight, and she'd probably get a title fight. I, I hope they don't rush her. Um, but yeah, she's fun to watch. What any other takeaways? Really, no other than. I kind of said before beforehand I expected her to win, expected her to win big, and it's just scary how close she is to title contention in that very, very shallow uh, women's bantamweight division. We were kind of saying the same thing uh, earlier, but we were talking about a straw weight, and there's not as much uh, danger that Amanda Hebas is going to get just shoved into a contender fight that she's not ready for. It's much more plausible at bantamweight. Yeah, um, the only person closer to a t- title shot is the the girl that just debuted this weekend in an amateur show who picked up a win at women's featherweight. She's one and zero amateur. She might be closer to title shot than Cal Rosa though. Oh yeah, like she's <laughs> like what? Get, you got, get her on the phone. You got a win at one forty five. Oh, it was amateur. Don't matter. You're in. You're in. Go 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 get some Um And the curtain jerker was a really really fun back and forth battle between Davy Grant and Martin Day. Ended with Davy Grant. Having a beautiful knockout actually got him 50k for that knockout. Uh, he did it while actually breaking his jaw in the first round. At least he said. I don't know if it was been confirmed. He said he felt like his his jaw was broken in the first round. Uh, perfect knockout. Beautiful way to start the evening. And somehow Davy Grant is on a two fight winning streak in the UFC. Good, good for him. Uh, part of it is competition. Martin Day is now 0 and 2. In the UFC, it may just be that he is not yet UFC material at this point in his career. But regardless of the level of competition, that is another win for dangerous Davy Grant. And he survives and advances. There you go, guys. We have covered all the fights. There was 13 fights in total. Uh, let's uh, we're talking about 0-2 fighters. Let's get to the cut list. If you guys remember that, how the cut list goes, cut list goes like this. We nominate fighters that we believe the UFC should cut. If both of us agree, that person we deem cuttable by the Shillin and Duffy show. Um, we don't necessarily mean this so much in negative sense. While you get rid of talent, that leaves open opens up doors for other talent to get in. I will go through first. And, and first of all, we're not going to talk about Paige Man's aunt. She, her contract's over. So while neither one of us expect her to fight in the UFC again, uh, we're not, she's not in the cut list. Um, I'll go with the guy we just talked about. Martin Day, he's 0-2 in the UFC. Um, he also had a loss in the contender series, so fighting under the UFC banner, he's 0-3. Getting knocked out by Davey Grant, who's really not known for his punching power. I nominate Martin Day to be cut. I second the motion. All right. Sorry, Martin Day, you're officially cut. Uh, you have anybody? I do. Uh, Vanessa Mello is 0-3 in the UFC. Has really not even offered any flashes of greatness and missed weight badly yeah twice even twice now. even in a yeah even in a division that is starving for contenders either stay and uh fight amanda nunez at 145 yeah. or you know go back to the, the the regionals you know for maybe some more seasoning yeah she's 0-3 uh she's faced some good competition i'll give her that but she has looked terrible in all three fights so i agree so long vanessa mello i'm gonna throw one more at you um, Danny Henry. He's been subbed 
first round of the last two fights, two fights in a row, quick finishes. I say time to get rid of Danny Henry. I wouldn't mind if they, they kept him, but we're talking about a cutthroat division where there are plenty of just scorching hot up and comers, you know, looking to get into the UFC, make room, you know, get someone else in here. And Henry, it has plenty of time to, to go back and fight on the know. Scotland regional scene. Well, the thing is he barely fought in Scotland. He had such a good record because he went and fought in Africa instead of fighting in like a UK promotion. That's part of the problem. Well, there you go. Yeah. All right, um, let's move on to the Bulls and the Bears. The Bulls and Bears is a stock market reference. Bulls is when the stock market is going up. Bears is when the stock market is going down, or, or particularly the stocks. Uh, do you want to do the Bulls or the Bears first? Oh, well, let's do the Bears. All right, so Bears, this is the bad ones. We got th- we have three picks, or we could have up to three picks. Do you want to go first or do you want to go second? Uh, I'll go first. All right, let's hear your – so, so you're going to do like three, two, one? Uh, I, I, I think I – just have two. Okay, but, there you go. Uh, bear number one for me is so this PFL. Is big, so this is your biggest loser. This is my biggest bear. Okay, PFL. <laughs> the PFL. There you, go. <laughs> you are a former PFL champ or former PFL contender. Just does not carry any weight anymore. Coming over into the UFC or heading over to, into Bellator or anything. You know, we already had a pretty disastrous performance by um, what's his name at uh, Felipe heavyweights Lins. Felipe Lins. thank you Felipe Felipe Linz uh very recently and then in comes uh Maxime Grishin who was really right up there one of the very best light heavyweights they've had for two seasons in a row uh and just looked absolutely awful against Martin Tibera and really looked awful in a way that doesn't it doesn't indicate that he would really have much to offer at light heavyweight either because the thing is it's not just that he got overpowered. He just looked inert. He didn't have anything to offer, didn't throw any offense, and just, yeah, got pushed around by Martin Tiberio for three rounds. All right. So so was, is that – is Philippe Baylands and, and Mark Sikorsky, that's the only ones from the PFL that come over to the UFC, right? I'm sure there have been others. Well, we, uh, we've had, like, what guys have fought in both. They went from the UFC to the PFL, but has it gone from the PFL to the – I think it's just those two. And they're 0-3 so far. Yeah, there, there, there you go. I mean, I'm sure I'll think of another one right. as soon as we get off. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And who? What's your your other bear? Holy cow! I just completely drew a a, a blank. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll throw mine out. Yeah, you I'll go. Throw, I'll Thank throw you. mine out there and see if you can think of it. Uh, my number three bear is uh, is Max Holloway. Like, like he could have won, and he very well won it. But I originally scored it for him. But that said, he has lost three of his last four. He's 0-2 against the current champion. He's in a really tough situation. He needs Alex Volkanovski to lose before he's a contender again. Or, you know, he's going to have a really, really long road back to the title. So, uh, bear from Max Holloway. Uh, my number two is light heavyweights turning to heavyweight. Now, obviously, guys like um, Daniel Cormier and Rene Couture and them have success, but recently has not been the same success. We think about uh, Maxim Christian moved up. He ended up losing. We recently had Ovin St. Preux do it. Recently had John Volante. They all lost. So light heavyweights moving up to heavyweight has not been going. They're, uh, they're going down. But my number one bear is Roman Bogatov. The guy came in, M1 champion. He is no longer undefeated. He committed four different fouls. Um, his corner man, I don't know if you saw this, his corner man got – someone caught him on uh, – it's all over the internet. His corner man had a neo-Nazi tattoo on the back of his of his uh, arm. I don't know how confirmed it is. I don't know that much about the neo-Nazi symbols, but uh, there is a symbol that looked like very similar to what was in his arm. And there is many people calling to cut a very young guy who was previously undefeated. People are calling to cut him after one fight. So uh, Roman Bogatov's stock is absolutely – Crashing. Did you think of your other bear? I did. And just a, a real quick uh, aside, doesn't surprise me to hear that about the corner man. Just as someone who watches a ton of Eastern European, Russian, former Soviet state MMA, kind of white supremacist, neo-Nazi extreme groups are really, really embedded in MMA over there. And in, in a, I mean, in a way that's frankly unfortunate, it sucks, 
but yeah, it doesn't doesn't surprise me that a guy debuting in the UFC, you know, had some of that stuck to his the, shoe. There is a this is the true story. Not, that's not neo Nazi, but similar thing. I went to a Bellator show recently, and it was a fighter. I can't remember who it was. He's a actually good fighter. He was cornered by guys that walked in with Mongols, the biker gang jackets on. Oh wow. Me, All right. me and Ed, I, I butcher his last name, Ed Carbazal there from Sherbal. Yeah. Carver, yeah, mm-hmm. I butcher his last name. Me and him were walking through the casino, and I'm a police officer. I know when a fight's going to break out. And I said, I, I put my hand in front of Ed. I'm like, back up, something's about to happen. And the, those same people who were just cornering him got in a fight uh, with these other guys. And then later on, we find out that those guys murdered the person later on. Oh. And this was like six months ago. <laughs> So Ed, Ed can confirm that story. Grief. Yeah, it was one. It was one they had back to back nights. I think it. I think it was the one where Rory McDonald and, and Douglas Lima, where Douglas Lima won that won the uh, welterweight. It was the night before. I can't remember who fought that night before, but whatever that card was. Uh, anyways, did, did you remember your second bear? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I forgot all, all about it. Uh, testicles. It was a terrible night oh. to be a <laughs> testicle or an owner of testicles with just. I mean, so many, I mean, so many just blatant and damaging fouls to the the lower regions. You know, <laughs> Jalga Shumagulov caught a couple, and then obviously Leonardo Santos. Luckily, he's forty. Hopefully, he's already had all the kids he wants. But yeah, bad night to be a testicle. And hopefully, this will just be a memorable aberration, and we won't see more of that in the future because that was awful. Yeah. Speaking of testicles, now that you say that, I actually think the fight. Was the one that I said that it was a Friday and Saturday events at Mohegan. I think it was um, the Matt Mitrion Sergey Haritonov. That was a Friday night fight that I was at. That might have been the one that the cornerman murdered somebody. Uh, but speaking of body pots, we might have to throw in Vanessa Mello's thighs as a bear right now. Um, <laughs> I'll go first for the Bulls. These are things, uh, guys who stock rows. Uh, number three, even though neither one of us were too impressed by him. Uh, seem like the rest of the MMA world is impressed by him, and that's Yuri Przaska, KO win over a former title contender, a highly ranked guy in your UFC debut. Um, that's what you want to do. So Yuri Przaska is my number three bull. My number two, Marco Americani. I mean, he was a favorite. That's what you do when you're favorite. You go out there, get a quick sub. I love that. I love that he helped the guy recover. And my number one, and this one is – listen, guys. It wasn't the best night for someone like Stock Rose. I don't know if anybody Stock Rose that much. So – yeah, I don't even like this pick as my number one. I, but I want to go with Amanda Hivas. Listen, I know she was a negative 900 favorite, um, but she did exactly what a huge favorite is supposed to do with that. Go out there, absolutely destroy the person, make it even more impressive than we expected. It was against a big name, pay-per-view owner. Um, her name, has her stock has rose. People are excited about her. So Amanda Hivas, to me, is my ultimate winner of the night. Ben, who are your bulls? Okay, my first bull is uh, people coming in off a long break. There were a couple fighters coming in off uh, kind of longer longer than a year layoffs that had specific kind of questions about them due to that. We had Rose Namajunas, we had uh, Leonardo Santos, and then we had Martin Day. So they went two and one, but uh, Namajunas and Santos in particular just looked sharp, looked at, at least as good as they did in their, their last appearance and just kind of answered all those questions. So, you know, hooray for a long vacation. Then uh, number two, a couple in a couple of our post uh, event breakdowns recently, I have put oxygen on the bears list. Just saying people that have been forced into weird training circumstances by covid have not done well. I've got to give credit where credit is due. A bull uh, now is weird training. you know, and just kind of like weird preparation and and out of the ordinary <laughs> fight camps. Because while Max Holloway and Jorge Masvidal both did lose their fights, they both did better than I expected. And fatigue did not seem to be like the main problem for either of them. When you couple that with uh, Mike Perry winning uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, hur- hooray for <laughs> training by zoom training with your girlfriend or, you know, eating steak and drinking tequila a week before a fight. Yeah. And he won again since then. Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> well, he resumed live sparring. There since then. There he go. decided, <laughs> decided he didn't need live sparring after all. And my number one was actually going to be Hebus as well. There for all go. the reasons you said, 
you know, you, you, you're expected to do more than just win when you're that big a favorite. And she dazzled. What a what a performance. All right, let's get uh, let's get to the grade. Um, I'll go first. I know the main event was not there was nothing that was too spectacular. Like nothing like it was a couple of good knockouts. Um, Yuri Prasakis knockouts. Um, David Grant's knockout was nice. Um, there was some really fun submissions with Hebas and Americani. So that I'm going to give him a good grade for that. The main event, uh, I think a lot of people would would dock the grade out of it, but I I don't think it was terrible. So I'm going to go with a B minus. What would you give the overall grade of the card? I'll give it a B, actually. I, I There were a lot of fun moments. Part of the problem is that the expectations were so high with this triple header of title fights at the top. But a couple of the fights dragged. The card itself was just so long with all three of the uh, title fights actually at least going into the fifth round. Plus, there were just so many fouls and just so many kind of ugly and weird fights on the undercard that it's definitely not an A, but it was a pretty good card. I'll give it a B. Yeah, uh, I'll go to my grave. I think I might be the number one guy in the world who's been saying this. Like, I'm the leading leading person for this. Is I do not understand why the UFC starts the card so late. I understand they, why they cater to the West Coast makes no sense to me. You think they don't want to be like the other sports? Uh, you you push fans away when your cards are ending close to two in the morning in the East Coast, and and. I know what happens. The Europeans are going to say, oh, my God, we have even worse. Yeah, I know. I'm on your side. I'm saying move it up early. It's still going to suck for you in Europe, but it would be less sucky. <laughs> than, <laughs> um, so don't bat, don't go against us, East Coasters. Like, join with us. Yep. Um, all right, guys. We covered all the fights in the most comprehensive recap, we believe, on the internet. Uh, ben, we have a card this Wednesday. We're not able to do a roundtable being this weird Wednesday card, but – I'm going to put you on the spot. Who wins the main event, Danny Gay or Calvin Cater? I want to say that Ige's going to just do something spectacular and knock him out or guillotine him, jump on his back, get a choke. But give me Cater. I think uh, Cater's just going to be a little bit niftier boxer. And, yeah, give me Cater by decision. Yeah, and you can tell by my accent, uh, I'm all over the Boston guy. I'm going to take Cal McKay. I'm going to take him to knock him out in the second round. Guys, uh, make sure you like, subscribe to do all that stuff over at Loudmouth MA and the brand new returned Sherdog Radio Network. We'll have more shows coming out this week. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. 